Welcome to the Electric Goddess Podcast. We're really excited today to have Kevin Hayes in our office talking about batteries with Luke. And today we are going to be discussing an introduction to electrolyte. Do you want to give yourself a quick introduction, Kevin? Uh, sure, yes. My name is Kevin Hayes. I'm the head of product and development at Ion Blocks, based out of Fremont, California. Uh, there we are producing high energy, high power batteries, focused around the uh, EV tall and uh, EV market. Sweet. All right, so this qu first question is one of our frequently asked questions that I'd like to direct to both of you is, what is electrolyte in a battery and what is its purpose? <clears throat> You, you go ahead, you go ahead. <laughs> I mean, so the electrolyte's main goal is the medium to move your lithium ions back and forth between your anode and cathode in your, in your battery. Uh, as a result, you get some side effects in there, but first and foremost, you just want to move those lithium ions back and forth. Yeah, I would say it's a, an ion solventation pathway that needs to remain a, a non-electron pathway. So it's a, it's a material that uh, you want to have approaching zero electrical, you know, true R. And uh, in a perfect world, you'd approach infinite ionic transfer rates. And so it's a challenge to find a material that is great at one and bad at the other. Yeah, and actually, I mean, a lithium ion battery electrolytes as we know them today aren't actually good at both of those processes at all because they actually fail at one due to the fact that we form an SCI in the first place. So. Good point. Yes. Um, but that's jumping ahead, I suppose. In, unless it's a titanate, do you want to mention why yeah. a titanate doesn't need to do that? Because I think it's good to, in an electrolyte talk, I think the L SCI is a critical part you know, to, to mention because it's uh, how we make the handoff to use the electrolyte. Well, I guess we generally refer to when we, when we start thinking about electrolytes, we're referring to mostly in graphite batteries, when we think of the SCI in graphite batteries. And that's because the, the potential of your graphite anode is so low that you get to a point of decomposition in your electrolyte in the first place. And therefore, you have to form the solid electrolyte interface uh, in, in order to get these electrolytes to work. But if we move back out of the realm of graphite and step back a little bit to the, the lithium titanates you're referring to, mm -hmm. their voltage windows are just so much higher than that of graphite that you end up working in an area where uh, you don't get that, that decomposition. It actually opens you up to a different world of solvents that you can start using that you can't use with graphite batteries. So. so is electrolyte the magic of the battery? Yeah, it's, it's a really critical part of the battery that makes or breaks the cell in performance, temperature, calendar life, safety. It's a, it's a very important part, but it's not what stores the energy. Yeah, it's, it's so much frustrating because a lot of people spend so much time focusing on developing these really cool materials for your anode and your cathode, but you still need the electrolyte to incorporate the two, frankly. And you can, you can make the greatest anode cathode in the world, but if you don't have the right electrolyte, then, then it's kind of worthless, yep. frankly. So, and it's a challenge, too, because you have to really bring together a lot of people with a lot of different worlds of knowledge in order to really make this work in synergy because uh, the, the electrolyte without it, I mean, again, you, you, you have to understand how those decomposition products play into, into your material in the first place. So, so it's a lot of trial and error with mm -hmm. the different materials and it can be, there's a lot of different ways to approach it. And I mean, frankly, trial and error is probably the first and foremost way people go about it. I mean, there's always this, the route of, uh, add something in and then cycle it and then find <laughs> out what happens, frankly. And yeah. if it works, you get good cycles and it doesn't, then you retry the next one. But I think it's really cool now that a lot of people are going to a lot more computational modeling and such where you can really start making more educated decisions and educated guesses on the, the right routes to electrolytes in the first place. So do, that. do people look for the weak disassociation potential bond in the, in the molecule and then estimate uh, where it will snap and where those sticky tails will, will reform to, to grow a, a carbonate formation or... Well, I mean, I think that the most traditional way is to look at the homo lumo of your electrolyte systems. Mm -hmm. But I mean, without getting too far into it, that, that's a good first estimation, but that, that's still really limiting once you start putting electrochemical potential over the whole thing. So it's still, I mean, I think that the work that's being done 
in a lot of the computational work to determine this is really good. But I'd say a lot of the progress has just still been done in the lab at this point. So. Thanks. Yeah, that's really exciting to learn more about electrolyte and what it does in the battery. Uh, what would you say is the difference between a solid state electrolyte and a liquid electrolyte? There's a lot of talk about both of those. Yeah, and I guess we've been mostly kind of talking about liquid electrolytes right now because that's probably mostly or almost completely what's in the market right now. I mean, I'd say nearly all your cells yep. that, that, that you touch right now have a liquid electrolyte in them. Uh, the difference being a solid electrolyte, I guess, is that it's based around either a solid ceramic or some sort of crystalline uh, uh, solid uh, lithium ion conductor where you can pass your, your lithium ions back and forth, again, between your cathode and your anode while still maintaining that electronic, higher electronic resistance. Yep. So, uh, which is even more of a challenge just due to lithium diffusion and solids just not nearly being the same as what they are in most uh, liquid systems. So. so it is a true solid, like when you look at it, it well, would be yeah, dense? It would be in the form of a solid, the phase of a solid. But a lot of folks are doing hybrids where they wet an electrode and then have a solid layer interfacing one side. and. Uh, <clears throat> that kind of fuzzies the line between. Uh, yeah, because you can you can also throw the polymer mixtures in there as well, mm -hmm. and you can get swallowing in the polymers as well. One of the biggest challenges is you can make these nice, thick, sintered um, solid electrolyte pellets, but maintain your contact between your cathode and your anode while you know you're, you're they're going these dynamic changes, especially in your anode side where you incorporate something like silicon or or lithium, where you're getting physical plating and stripping taking place there. Maintain that interface between your electrolyte and your, your anode is, is a huge challenge, and that's where a lot of these hybrid systems start to come into play. So, so the, the liquid compensates for the volumetric change on one side. Right, right. So, I mean, because once you think you're, you're starting to strip all of that, that anode away, or in the case of silicon, starting uh, owling that lithium in there, you gain that silicon expansion, that, that interface, maintaining that, is always a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. so. I'll ask you about the advantages of liquid electrolytes since that seems to be industry standard, but what are some of the benefits of having a solid electrolyte? Why is this a huge marketing, um, the future of batteries? I mean, the, <clears throat> the, there's a nice convenience that if you have a puncture in your cell envelope or can wall, it doesn't leak or weep. But uh, from that point forward, I think it's um, a lot of stiff penalties. In ionic mobility, I I personally like the uh, compressed gas electrolytes. Yeah, those they, are super. Neat. Yeah, <laughs> taking taking the other phase, you know, rather than going uh, solid liquid, I'd rather go to gas and squeeze it hard enough that it works as a that or just use electrolyte. it at low enough of a temperature, I suppose, where you can actually get those things to operate mm -hmm. uh, and maintain a, in a liquid state. But also with the liquid electrolytes, the biggest worry is, or the, the number one reason everyone talks about getting rid of a liquid electrolyte is the fact that it's a flammable electrolyte. Right. Uh, all of your electrolytes that you use in lithium ion batteries today are based off of organic solvents, and they're all quite flammable when it comes down to it. But again, we require those solvents because that's what we use to form a stable SCI that can handle the electrochemical window of a lithium ion battery in the first place. But yeah, so we, we, we talk about the, the flammability of them as the biggest issue. Uh, and that's the main reason everybody wants to move to the solid electrolytes with this idea that we're going to vastly improve the safety of our batteries uh, by moving to solid electrolytes in the first place. Wow, so are they using chemical compounds that are somehow better for human health? I've seen some stuff out there like that's well, maybe not as healthy if you like yeah. were around a solid electrolyte there's, there's, but if it's not like coming at you maybe it's not a non-issue there's kind of this challenge that uh you know the reactivity of something has uh, some scaling relationship with its uh, ionic mobility and uh when you get a solid to the level that it passes ions through it at a useful rate uh, in general, this means its reactivity level is, is uh, like at insanity. And uh, this is why uh, materials like LPS are pyrophoric, hydrophoric, you know, on, uh, on exposure with, with air, with humidity, with water. Mm -hmm. they, they burst into flames and before decomposition and their decomposition products 
are lethal to humans at the milligram per kilogram LD50 range. And so uh, making the argument from a safety perspective, knowing that the battery stores energy and knowing that you could be in a crash and knowing that uh, it's far too easy to get a lethal exposure. You know, I would, you know, I, I can't tell you how many uh, cc's of carbonate esters I've breathed in my life running tests, but uh, it's, it's fortunately chemically a, similar to acetone. Yeah. And if you were cleaning with acetone a lot, you know, not good for you. And I think it hurts your liver and maybe brain damage as well, but uh, it, it doesn't kill you in, in minutes. No, which I mean, is, to be clear, uh, which like is a, a bummer. Avoid touching electrolytes by all means if you can. I mean, they're, they're, they're not healthy, but uh, but yeah, I think we do confuse sometimes that the electrolytes the only, I guess, safety oriented you mm -hmm. know aspect in your cell. I mean, you still have your your cathode, which in delithiated state, again, GAC, there's a strong oxidizer as well. That's right. So. The, the cathode alone is is a thermite risk, whether there was no electrolyte and whether you had a solid electrolyte, it wouldn't make any difference on that coated foil yeah, decomposition so, process. I mean, there's a lot of really good work going into making even non-flammable liquid electrolytes in the first place. Cool. But even those, while I think they can solve problems related to the safety in the cell, they're not the end-all be-all solution to it. So. Mm -hmm. There's been years on liquid electrolyte research, enough that you can have a computational models now. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of getting in that early stages of solid electrolytes to try to just add maybe one more safety component where we've seen some really cool materials that go into cell oh, that wow. maybe stop thermal runaway. Like we've punched holes through cells and like nothing happens to yeah. them. And yeah, oh, we've, we've had some amazing safety tests like five nail pens at 100% state of charge preheated and you still have to just take the cell out and discharge it because nothing <laughs> happened you know and when I'm pulling the cell out of the fixture the nail sparkling all the way out you know and yeah and nothing's I mean, happening to the cell as it, as it sparkles. I think that's cool because that's like the first aspect of you know keeping a thermal runaway reaction mm -hmm. from taking place is the initiation right mm -hmm. if you can control that initiation from taking place then I mean that's obviously a huge huge benefit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, the, because the thermal runaway takes place in a series of events, uh, there's multiple points theoretically where you could stop that thermal runaway reaction from taking place. So it's not just electrolyte when you're saying safety. It's just a component. Oh, yeah. I, I was just saying it's, it's one aspect that when a cell is in thermal runaway, it affects uh, the behavior of that thermal runaway. Yeah. And, you know, there's uh, unfortunately a trend towards the electrolytes that have awesome calendar stability and good voltage stability often have uh, more aggressive uh, thermal runaway tendencies due to reactive fluorine ions being liberated in that process. Yeah, I mean, I think that just comes back to, I mean, not all these liquid electrolytes are the same, right? Everyone right. has very unique oh, formulations yeah. to match their right. needs. And really it always just comes down to a matter of give and take when it comes to developing an electrolyte. It's really, I mean, an ideal world, you want an electrolyte that does everything for you. Uh, you know, have a high lithium transfer, very high thermal stability, great thermal runaway properties. But all of this, usually, you're pulling one way and you're, you're, you're losing mm -hmm. some other fashion as a result, so. Um, you want to comment on hot weather performance electrolytes versus cold weather performance electrolytes? And Well, yeah, I mean, even if you, you start thinking, you know, differences in temperatures in general, you have to start thinking about even the, the boiling point of your base solvents and, and where you're working there. And you can really optimize an electrolyte for a given temperature range because based off the vapor pressure, you have to decide, okay, what, what area am I going to work in? Am I going to start getting into a, a region where we can start developing gas in the cell? And while that might not be a, as big a problem in hard can sort of cells like your prismatics and your cylindricals, when you're moving to pouch cells, you definitely want to stay away from that area. Mm -hmm. But you have to trade off there as a result because as you move to, say, a higher boiling point solvent, you're also more in, moving towards a more viscous solvent as well. And so you start mm -hmm. losing your lithium transference as a result. So. Is, it, is it possible to, uh, I, I know when you have a normal solvent boiling point, you can add, say, uh, if you had a, 100 milliliters of acetone or something, you could add one milliliter of a really heavy long chain oil mm -hmm. and it would lower the whole, or it would raise the whole boiling point of the, of the solvent solution by some amount. Is, do people use additives 
in this fashion today, or would it would it also impede the lithium mobility rate by the same amount that it reduced the boiling rate or increased the boiling temp? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, it seems more often you still see it and, you know, there's a fine line between what we consider an additive and a co-solvent, I suppose. Okay. But it seems often enough you still see that more in the co-solvent range more than the additive range. So, I mean, again, you know, the, the, depending who you talk to, you know, 5% can seem like an additive or a co-solvent at okay. that point. But right. again, once you get to that area, you're still probably going to start seeing physiochemical changes within your, your solvent system where you go impact the conductivity and such. Can you comment on, uh, you know, you, you've mentioned it a few times, but the decomposition products, and uh, obviously when we grow the SEI in formation, you know, we, we need it to break down to, uh, to passivate the surface, but can you comment on what happens during the life of a cell post formation and uh, post its first few cycles of, of completing formation? What are the sources of uh, decomposition, like electrostatic field stress on the electrolyte order? What, what's the main causes that you see decomposition and associated gas production from after formation? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I think that the SEI is still most, like the most complicated subject in batteries. I mean, I think if anyone tries to argue they really understand the SEI, they're only speaking like 50% of the truth because there's okay. so much in there that I think that we still don't know because it's such a hard system to study in general. I mean, just the, the, the artifact of studying the SEI, you often change the SEI. So, you, you know, a lot of people <laughs> make assessments of trying to understand it. Right. But again, I mean, if you look at a lot of your, your high power techniques, you, you end up changing the SEI somehow fundamentally even in the process of uh, measuring it. Uh, so it always comes back to that, that question of, okay, of, okay, what am I actually looking at here? And, and what's it mean? Now, in general, I mean, I think a lot of the, the impact of the SEI comes from the, the, the fact that you're sitting outside the, the voltage stability window of the, the, the uh, electrolyte itself. So once you, again, the, form a stable interface at your, your, either your anode or your cathode for that matter, hopefully that acts as a solid electron barrier at that point and you're, you're no longer going to grow that, that interface further. But we know is that truthfully, even in your best graphite cells, your, your SEI still continues to grow slowly, which eventually causes cell death in some fashion or other. And usually what you'll end up seeing is your resistance goes up, or like you said, you start seeing gas production. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether that gas production is coming from the cathode or the anode, that really, again, depends on the system. But usually it's some combination of both, frankly. And whether you're oxidizing your electrolyte or continuing to reduce it, I mean, it, 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 you're, you're playing that game back and forth again still. Just which end is breaking off first, right? right? Right, and then you even have the, the problem of uh, crosstalk, where again, the, the decomposition products from one of your electrodes is migrating through your electrolyte and causing mm. more decomposition products on your other electrode. So, so that's even uh, one step further in the, in the whole aspect of understanding do you, this. Do you see uh, a lot of manganese end up in your, uh, or any anodes? I know you've done hundreds of research projects with cells, but how often do you see no, I, I, I realize the manganese dissolution and transfer is, mm -hmm. is a problem. Like, is, how real of a problem is that in, in high nickel cathodes used today? Yeah, I mean, you, you almost always see some of it, the degree of it. That's always kind of the, the challenge. Um, I, I think it, it also really depends on what NMC material that you're really using as well. I think, you, again, as you go to higher and higher nickel materials, you start seeing that problem more and more. Okay. Yeah. So... Do you ever see nickel migration or is it? Um, you know, it, it's always a challenge, right? I mean, when you start doing elemental analysis of these electrolytes, you're always going to start, start seeing a little bit of everything because you, you pick up a lot of stray bits here and there. Um, just mechanical, you're saying not, not electrochemically driven nickel, but just like uh, yeah, particles that were loosely bound? I, I mean, I think, again, I think the majority of it, I think, comes from manganese, though. Okay. Um, at, at least from what I've seen. And I, I think there's other people that might say different. Do you, do you think that's one of the reasons why uh, Tesla likes NCA? Well, yeah, in general, but again, I think as we, we see them starting to work on their new cells, I think they're going to start moving more away from NCA, especially to move to less cobalt-type systems. Again, I think the, one of the biggest priorities is trying to get rid of as much of that cobalt in the cathode as possible. 
which means moving to a higher nickel and higher manganese system as, as a result. So Less stable, too. Right, yeah. I mean, ideally, there's a lot of people that want to work on uh, uh, lithium nickel manganese oxide systems, uh, but the voltage window of those systems are so much higher. Again, you start getting into a realm where your, your electrolyte is just not even stable to work with this. I have a silly question. Does electrolyte have anything to do with how much you can charge a cell? Oh, yeah. And how long it lasts sitting charged, too. But uh, while Kevin's here, I feel like he should, <laughs> he should answer. He's really more qualified. I mean, yeah, so it, it absolutely has an impact. Again, I mean, all your electrolyte systems have a, a, a voltage window where they're, they're, they're stable. So generally, most of those systems are only stable up to about 4.2, 4.3 volts versus lithium. Uh, once you get beyond that, you really start decomposing a lot of those solvent systems into gaseous products and other oxidized. That curve of stability he's talking about around 4.2, 4.3 goes up with a, a very steep slope up to complete disassociation by like 4.4 or something, you know, of everything, right? Right, yeah. I mean, but even that said, I mean, l traditional lithium cobalt oxide cells have been around for a while. Yeah. And those work best around 4.45 volts. Right. And there are additives and there are ways to make those electrolyte systems work. And quite effectively, frankly. I mean, I think if we all had the option and we, we could use high cobalt cathodes oh, forever. I love I cobalt we, oxide. Yeah. I think we would. It's a great cathode. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, the, it's one of the originals and it's still probably one of the best, frankly. It, it's we got to recycle all of our little electronic trash in America to get all that LCO yeah. back, right? Yeah. It's, it's got another 100... 30, 120 degrees before it gives up its oxygen and its cathode too. So the number of events with LCO that just become a, a boiling electrolyte vapor cloud relative to a, a thermitic reaction, you know, it's, it's in its favor. Yeah, there's a lot to love about LCO. lithium cobalt oxide yeah. for sure. Just minus the cobalt, I'd say. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does lithium metal <clears throat> have different electrolytes, like lithium metal cells? Yeah, and I think you can think about this again in two realms. So you have uh, electrolyte systems for lithium metal in the traditional liquid electrolyte world, and then you have all of your uh, solid state electrolyte systems for lithium metal. I, I think people kind of can confuse the two and just throw them all into one category often because I think right now everyone thinks for lithium metal cells the only feasible route often enough is solid state cells right. but there are a lot of interesting technologies that are working with liquid electrolytes for lithium metals as well yeah we have some friends down in san diego that are doing a gas lithium metal too i think yeah yeah so yeah. it's cool it doesn't it's just kind of the chemistry of the cell then right well, and i mean again you're, you're you're playing with the challenges with lithium metal in particular of of stripping and planing and maintaining a, a nice interface with the lithium metal where you're not growing uh, dendrites to a fa point that you can cause failure within the cell. So, Do you want to comment on ways if, let's say, that the cell has a, a disuniformity in its, in its anode when it begins to grow? Do you want to be, comment on the uh, effects of having the electrostatic field concentrated into some point? As it, like if you have any, any sort of a microdendrite begin to form. Can you share how that behavior uh, progresses? Well, I mean, yeah, I think that's always kind of the, one of the main things is trying to control that dendrite growth, like you said. I mean, you, you have all these different forms of dendritic lithium growth, and I mean, you have mossy lithium versus, you know, these more pine tree looking mm -hmm. lithiums and all. And I think some of the coolest work I've seen is where people have found ways to zap away those dendrites in the first place. So if you pulse them at a high enough current, you can actually burn those off and get more life out of the cell. Oh, like, like reverse pulse plating when you're electroplating, you burn right. positive current for like 90% of the time, and then you hit it hard for 10% of the time and go back to positive current. And all the high places yeah. are consumed in that brief reverse pulse. Yeah, so there's a lot of routes and, and, well, and challenges of trying to, to find ways to burn away those and, and keep that cell running longer. Clover. You two are really efficient. We've hit a lot of our questions already. <laughs> <clears throat> I think one thing is when you, we're choosing a battery cell for an application, we really think what are the demands of that application. And when it comes to electrolyte choices, is one electrolyte desirable over another? Can you make a general statement on that? Or is it really specific to what you're using it for? 
I okay. think, you know, it just depends how extreme your requests are for your batteries. I mean, I think there's a lot of batteries that can generally work well over a wide range of, you know, applications. Uh, if, again, you're not pushing the cell too extreme in one direction or another. Now, once you have harder requests for the cells, especially when we start talking, again, uh, like things like uh, electric aircrafts and uh, eVTOLs, then you have to really start tailoring it much closer to the cell requirements. And again, that's when we start getting to this area of really figuring out what the demands on the cell are and building that, that electrolyte to those demands in particular. So, yeah. Can, as, as someone who's uh, done some VTOL work, I know the landing on a low battery at the end, you know, especially in the, in the like uh, mission profile where you lose a motor or whatever it is, you know, they always have some higher power demand, you know, for their application than expected and landing in that situation. Can you comment on what causes an electrolyte to resist gas production when it's under a high rate C rate discharge at a low state of charge situation? Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's definitely a couple things playing in here. I mean, in general, when you're getting those lower SOCs in your cell, a lot of cell chemistries are bound to have an increase in resistance as mm -hmm. you start to go to those much mm -hmm. lower values. And then you end up getting some heating in there as well. So I think you're, you're kind of playing a game of, again, just trying to maintain a, a low resistance system and, uh, and making sure the cell's really not overheating or, or polarizing too much at those points. So is that something that mainly affects a graphite anode system if that impedance climb at the end is due to the, the anode's impedance? Yeah, I mean, so, you, you, you know, it, well, first, it's, it's still a combination of both the anode and cathode, so it's not to, to, to play one versus the other. I mean, you, you're, you're, you're seeing that um, you, you're shifting that last bit of lithium everywhere there, so that, that's really, you're starting to see that resistance jump there at, at the end. But, yeah, I think a lot of it still is playing from the anode in general. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, again, it's just controlling your... Uh, your heating within the cell to some extent. So, and understanding having a solvent system that's, again, stable there, frankly. Well, I've, I've seen pouches that gas when I, you know, hit them with high C rate, even for, say, 10 second pulses, where they only increased a few degrees total net temperature, you know, so like the, the net change in partial pressure of the electrolyte should be really low, but they produce a, uh, a volume of gas, you know, right right after that pulse, you know, sure. like almost yeah. real time with the pulse. Well, and I think there's, you know, uh, there's two things that you can play in there too. I mean, you... In fact, cell voltage is really low too. It's being pulled to like three volts or something under the sag, you know, cause it's already low and it's getting a high C rate discharge. So there's very little voltage stress. Okay. And I've wondered why on earth do they produce gas with very little voltage stress and they've only increased a few degrees. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious. I mean, was there a lot of polarization across the cell at that point, or? Uh? Yeah, yeah, it had, it had a long discharge. Okay. You know, long continuous discharge up to that point. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really tricky too. I guess just again, just coming down to so many different cell chemistries, and right. just understanding what exactly is going on in each one. There is there's so many different things that one could put into your electrolyte that could be a a factor there that you know. Five five three two NCM cathode. Graphite anode. See, to me, if you were to ask me, that seems like a nice staple system that should be. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, I was surprised. Easy and good why to go. did they make gas too? You know, it was yeah. really low voltage. It, I'm, I'm assuming it's got to be from the electrolyte doing something. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, if you were to tell me it was happening at high voltages, I feel like I could give you a much nicer answer. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't have <laughs> asked. It's a mystery it was of high voltages. High voltages. Uh, but you might have stumped me on that one. Okay. No worries. Well, maybe we'll put one in the microscope. We'll we'll build one with with microscope slides and uh, increase C rate until we see it evolve. And, yeah. Uh, we're we're also going to do on that topic of SEI, uh, Raman the surface of an anode pre formation, and then Raman it uh, in the in the first stages of formation, then like mid formation, then finished formation, yeah. and hopefully uh, there'll be some identifiable wave number shifts that uh, we can back out what compounds non-destructively. Well, and I think it's interesting because you're talking about the formation now and the, the formation of this, this aspect of the cell that's kind of overlooked, but is a really costly aspect of the cell in general. 
I mean, a lot of uh, the industry spends a lot of money and time just forming, forming the, the cells, cell. right? Yeah. Which is, again, the, the first couple of charge and discharge of the cell. And yeah. that's really just the initial formation, the, the SCI in that first place. Do you want to, you want to talk about pre-formation and why it often takes like 18 to 24 hours and, and why formation takes 12 to 18 hours or more? What does this have to do with the electrolyte? Just curious. Oh, formation is caused when the electrolyte decomposes onto the anode in the first cycle of the cell after it's been assembled. So the, the electrolyte forms the, the SEI. Yeah, and, and you, the, the, the goal of a good formation is to, again, form that SEI as kind of smoothly and stably as possible. If you kind of rush into it, you end up forming an SEI that is not uh, doing a good job of that, that electron, high electron resistance, and you, you get kind of a, a leaky SEI, I guess you could think of it as. Is that like uh, ionic contaminant inclusions in it? Uh, it's just more that, I mean, and this is more so for graphite probably than anything. You just need to do it very slowly uh, per, uh, instead. Um, again, just to uh, get that, I guess, as, and again, kind of as solid as possible, I suppose you could say. And uh, in addition to that, the, during that, that, that SEI formation, especially on those first couple cycles, you're also forming a lot of gas products. Right. So also during that time frame, you want to get as rid of as much of that gas product as possible. Because once you send that, in. yeah, right. Because once you seal that cell and send it out, I mean, that whatever is left in there is what you're dealing with yep. it for for the rest of the life of the cell. So, um, and uh, yeah, a, a couple of mils of gas at the beginning does not sound like that big a problem, but it starts to add up as the cell continues oh, yeah. to cycle. I'm just imagining all these primordial elements coming together, and you're like, I'm forming you, and it's like a new cell come to life. It is. Yeah, that's that's basically formation. Thanks. Yeah, and I said it's super important, it's super costly within the industry because there's rooms and rooms and rooms where these companies just are cycling racks and racks and racks right. of these batteries, just getting them ready to go out the door. So, wow. Um, so to summarize our electrolyte conversation, this has been really fun today. I like to think of batteries in the present state and like what we're looking to do in our lifetimes, right? And then I also like to think about what are the next generation is going to be looking at. And my question to you is, what is your favorite electrolyte and what would you like to see in the future? My example is I'm a huge Stargate fan. And so I'd love to see like crystals used as energy sources for the future. So I don't know what the electrolyte in a crystal looks like. But as far as helpful information for today, what is your favorite electrolyte and why? Oh, man. Well, I, I'm actually a big fan of the, 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 some of the more recent work on, on water-based electrolyte systems that people are starting to incorporate back into lithium-ion batteries. Again, as we're trying to move to more environmentally, environmentally friendly systems again, I think they're very interesting. I think they're a long way out at this point, but I think we're kind of in the early stages of trying to make these work. Are those fluorine free too? Uh, no, no, they, they, those in fact do have uh, lithium fluorine type salts in them already. Wow. Uh, they're just working on concentration levels where they can kind of stabilize them. Um, so I think they're really interesting systems. But I think also more importantly, we're in an era now where um, there's a lot more customization going on ex exactly for kind of what the battery is meant to do, I suppose. So where now we're kind of all kind of playing mostly, and this is a very generalization, but we're all basically playing with the same battery, more or less. A lot of people are producing some iteration of a very similar battery at mm -hmm. this point. Now we're moving into a realm that based off of exactly what you're trying to do with the battery, it can be really customized a lot more towards that specific application, I think. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. Luke, do you awesome. have an opinion on your favorite electrolyte um, and why? <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess I'd have to say, uh, DEC and EC blend with <laughs> stabilizers because they power all my stuff and I'm grateful. But uh, which is I, the exact opposite from the thing I just <laughs> said. Yeah. Um, I do love uh, the potentials in the compressed gas electrolytes, and we have a few cells here with compressed gas electrolytes. And I, I was concerned for their safety, you know, because um, I didn't know how they'd behave, right? And so we did overheat and overcharge initiations and 
it was shockingly chill. So, yeah. Whoa. I had, you know, that, that gives me, the opposite. yeah, I was, I was guessing, you know, we, we prepared like it was going to be a, a real event and it was a kitten. So yeah, it was great. Well, and until you test a lot of these, you just have no idea how they're going to interact. Right? Yep. I mean, we, we did it in the concrete bunker area. So in, in a stainless vessel in the concrete bunker with us all on the other side of the concrete bunker. I'll show you it outside afterward. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, and then it goes, which is oh. <laughs> so funny because some of these like classic systems even ones that we quote unquote have think are safe in the past you you think nothing big's going to happen they have the biggest you know oh yeah you know bang That's of right. your life and you, you you learn your lesson once on those ones for sure i mean the the biggest explosions i've ever seen and seen pictures of from uh, batteries are of course lead acid data center rooms that filled up with oxyhydrogen mixtures you know oh yeah they wow. it, levels all the walls, puts the roof in the, in the parking lot. And wow. Complete demo. Oh, that, that's <laughs> and that's, that's lead acid from an aqueous electrolyte. Just, yeah. Uh, so uh, even those systems, which are considered the bread and butter of you know, old batteries, are still yep. have their challenges. That's right. Yeah, they need yeah. continuous ventilation and hydrogen monitoring. And yeah. They are, yeah. I mean, all, all electrolytes have challenges, right? Even the iron nickel cell. It yeah. lasts so long, the potassium hydroxide tends to uh, uh, electrolysis. You know, when, when you float charge to equalize your string, it, it batters uh, potassium hydroxide and like destroys everything around it. Your electrodes are fine, but like the, the house the battery's in is destroyed by the electrolyte, you know, yeah, so from the float charge. <laughs> there's no perfect system by any means. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. liked what you said about you optimize one thing and you take it away. I think about Mario Kart when you're trying to optimize your cart and your like parachute and it's like, which one do you want? Your yeah. speed, your weight. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to speak with both of you. Thank you, Kevin, for your time today. Thank you, Erica. Thank uh, you, Luke. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you my friend. Yeah, Absolutely. you are so accomplished in batteries. Your introduction was so humble for a man who has done so much research over the last few decades in batteries. I'm, I'm really... Uh, a fan of your work. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.